gentlemen, here's your host of Chop Talk, Lena Timbo. Hi guys, and welcome back to this episode of Chop Talk. I am actually very excited for this episode because we're touching on two cuisines that I actually love the most, and that's Jamaican and El Salvadoran or any type of Latin cuisine, actually. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. But first, I'm gonna go ahead and share something. I accidentally discovered this recipe for this perfect oven-baked chicken because I forgot that I did not have foil, and when I went to the grocery store, I just decided to just go ahead and just use parchment paper instead, and this turned out perfectly. So I'm gonna go ahead and show this video for this chicken. All right, let's get into it. Hey, what's up? It's your girl, Chef Lala, and on today's episode of Cooking with Lala, we're gonna be making some baked chicken thighs that actually turned out to be very crispy, and I'm serving that with some Rockefeller potatoes and some asparagus. Let's get into it. Hey guys, so as you all know, this is a chicken dish, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. I've gone ahead and cleaned and prepped my chicken. I used vinegar, salt, and water. I let this sit for about 30 minutes, and then I rinsed it off. So what you're gonna need is olive oil, Italian seasoning, paprika, and I have this lovely salt and pepper mix where it's just equal parts salt and pepper and some plain non-fat yogurt. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and start with the olive oil and then we're gonna do the dry spices and we're gonna finish it off with yogurt and then we're gonna place it in the fridge to marinate for about one hour. potatoes are cooking we're gonna go ahead and work on this spinach crumble the Rockefeller of the Rockefeller potatoes what we're gonna need is some shallots garlic some red pepper flakes butter and of course some freshly chopped spinach if you can't find fresh spinach in your grocery store frozen spinach will work just as well I just prefer the fresh one because the frozen one tends to produce a lot of water and anybody gets time for that to a hot pan we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna add some butter we're gonna add the shallots, the garlic, and the red pepper flakes. We're gonna cook this a little bit, making sure not to overcook the garlic because we already know how that tastes. Ugh. So we'll probably cook that down for all of two minutes, and we're gonna go ahead and add the spinach. We're gonna cook the spinach until it's wilted, and once that's done, we're gonna put it to the side, and we're gonna mix in that mixture that we we're talking about. In a separate bowl, you're gonna go ahead and wanna add just equal parts of breadcrumbs and grated Parmesan cheese. We're gonna go ahead and mix that. We're gonna add it to the spinach dish and we're gonna allow that to cool down. To the potatoes, we're gonna go ahead and add some mozzarella cheese. And on top of that, we're gonna go in with that Rockefeller crumble. We're gonna spread that evenly over top of the potatoes. Make sure you cover every end of a potato, baby. We're gonna put that on broil for about five minutes and we're gonna start preparing our chicken to go in the oven. You're gonna wanna go ahead and transfer your chicken into a baking dish. To the baking dish, we're gonna go in there and add that broth. We're gonna preheat our oven back to 375 and we're gonna go ahead and let that chicken cook for about an hour. Wine break. We're gonna go ahead and allow the chicken to brown by changing the oven from bake to broil, and we're gonna do this for about three minutes. Because no dish of mine is complete without a vegetable, what I went and did was prepare some asparagus. I sauteed these in some butter and added a few drops of lemon and salt. Wow, this is exactly how your chicken should look. I mean, look at this. You want a nice crispy skin. You need to hear this. You want a nice, soft and juicy, tender center. And you want something packed full of flavor. And here you have it, guys. Yummy. So 
so I went ahead and I went ahead and paired this with some asparagus because I cannot have a meal without asparagus. Let's get into it. So you're looking for this crunchy skin, but tender meat on the inside, which you look at that. We're gonna get a little bit of everything. Oh my god. Bomb. But this is so good, I just cannot stop. Like, let me know if you try this recipe. We're gonna go ahead and jump right into the next segment of the show. We have a performer, her name is Justine Lauren, and she's going to perform, and she says that music is her language, so we're just gonna hear what she has to say, sing and say. She is a multi-talented artist. She plays the guitar, piano, and she also sings. So Miss Justine, the stage is all yours. Hi everyone, so I'm here to serve an you all. Our first set, we will be singing Baby Now That I Found You. Sit back and try and relax. One, two, three, one. She was someone I can forget
was beautiful. I never actually knew the lyrics to that song until just now. And wow, music is your voice. That was beautiful. All right, so that is Miss Justine Lauren. And now we're gonna go ahead and get into the next segment of the show. And I do wanna go ahead and encourage you all to be very attentive with the questions and the answers that are being answered because today's giveaway, you're gonna get a chance to win this lovely USB bracelet and the questions that I'm going to ask are questions that are going to be answered by our featured guest. So our first guest of the evening is Mr. Omar. Mr. O Mr. Omar is the owner of Los Cholos Restaurant. It is in Wheaton, Maryland. And I know that today he'll be demonstrating a video of how to make pupusas. So I'm actually pretty interested in that because I love me some pupusas, but I don't know how to make them. And yeah, so we're actually gonna be learning together. Make sure you can see me or hear me. Yes, perfect. You know, so I'm happy to be here. And I guess we're going to be talking a little bit about pupusas, the pretty much the national food of uh, El Salvador. I'm excited. I love pupusas again, but I just don't know how to make them. They just seem so complex, but I'm pretty sure it's very simple. Well, it takes a little bit of practice, just like anything. I mean, these, you know, the pupusas are traditionally, you know, done by, made by hand. Um, so the technique just takes a lot of practice. 
And um, honestly, it's, it's a lot of fun to do. And it's something that's, um, I recommend even trying with your kids. You know, it's almost like they're playing with Play-Doh um, because, you know, the, it's flour, it's corn flour with water. It's very simple, um, but it's a staple food. Um, you know, tortillas are staple food through, through a lot of Latin America um, regardless. But, um, but the pupusas are pretty much just stuffed tortillas. And the fun part about it, when you come from a culinary background or, you know, you like to cook, is you can really experiment with uh, the different fillings. You know, you can, you know, traditionally it's cheese and pork, um, but you can definitely do like bean and cheese. And, uh, um, you know, there's so many different options. You know, my restaurant, we do jalapeno and cheese. We do, you know, bean and cheese, squash and cheese. Um, so I've seen people do shrimp. Um, so you can really um, just really experiment play and play with it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. No, I am very simple. I like my bean and cheese. And what's that sauce, the red sauce called? Yeah, the sauce is just, it's just a tomato sauce that we make. So traditionally the pupusas are, are served with a pickled cabbage and it's cabbage, it's shredded cabbage, usually a little bit of carrots in there, um, shredded as well. Um, it's got vinegar. We use we use apple cider vinegar. I think sometimes in Central America, a lot of people use pineapple vinegar, um, but we you know use apple cider. Gives it a little bit more of a t uh, better taste, in my opinion. Um, and then you have the different spices, you know, salt, oregano, a um, little bit of garlic. Um, so that's really traditional. So you usually serve the pupusa with the, the pickled cabbage, and then a lot of people would put the little salsa on there. The salsa is just um, tomatoes, onions, cilantro, salt, and pepper for the most part. Um, and then if you want to spice it up a little bit, you can put a little bit of jalapeno yep. in it. Yep. Yep. Or habanero. I like I like spicy, so, you know, I, I kick it up with uh, some habanero. Though, yeah, you know, it's a... in Salvadoran cuisine, it's not traditional to do, to do spicy. So our food really is not, um, is not really spicy at all. But, um, but you can definitely make it. The jalapeno pupisas are, are something that I that I created, you know, um, just out of my own taste. That's good. I mean, definitely like mark up yourself. But so pupusas, are they normally found at uh, your, your, you know, your parties, weddings, graduations, quinceas, birth, um, birthday parties? Is it always there? It just, it just depends. Um, it's a very traditional food. A lot of times they eat them like for breakfast or like lunch. So sometimes you won't find them in some restaurants at night. But honestly, it's just like when you go, you know, you go out to like when you're, I guess when I was younger, go out to the clubs and then afterwards, you know, you find that pizza spot, you know, it's just that comfort food, you know, it's just yes. that comfort food. And in El Salvador, it's the same kind of deal. Um, you'll definitely find them, you know, being made at two in the morning. You know, I just, I was just there in April. Um, in April, I was there and uh, we went to this little area on the beach that had a lot of nightlife. And we left at two in the morning and we stopped by this little pupusa place. And this lady was making pupusas on the side of the road, you know, wow. so very traditional. You find it everywhere. Um, but um, the technique, and I don't know if they're going to play the video. Um, it's just yeah, me. Are. You know, it's just me. So the video is just me. It's part of a clip from a longer video that I had of me actually physically forming the pupusa um, in order to put it on the grill. Um, so I've made the corn flour oh. dough, which is like just water and corn flour, which we call it maseca. And then yeah. from there, you just mix it up. You knead it till it gets to the consistency, almost of like Play-Doh. Um, you make a ball, um, you flatten it out into a round disc, and then you stuff it in the center with whatever filling you want. You close it up. And then the technique and, and the key is in the flattening of it. Um, so that's what takes a little bit of practice. And that's what shows in the video is that process of you flatten and turn, flatten and turn until you get that perfect round disc um, that is a pupusa. And then from there, you just put it on the griddle until it's like golden brown. Oh my God. So it's cooked on the grill. Yeah, on the griddle. Sorry, it's on the, it's on the- Oh, it's on, okay. It's on the like a flat yeah. grill. Yes, yes. All right, yep, here we so, have it. Yeah, so the mixture that I'm using there is like a pork mixed with cheese. So you just blend it together and that's what you see in the middle. That's the filling. So I'm closing the ball up. Um, so I had made like a flat tortilla. I close the ball up. Once you do that, you start flattening it out. Usually you'll get a little piece of extra. And it always it's always like that. It's a tradition. You always take off the little extra piece so you don't get like a big chunk of dough on one dough, side of it. Right. And then this is the technique um, that 
from my mom. This is what I learned from my mom. And you just flatten and turn, flatten and turn. Um, and this is what takes a little bit of practice. You can put some oil or some water on your hands just so it doesn't stick too much. Um, but normally we use water at my restaurant so they're not too greasy. Um, and that's the pupusa right there. Once it's ready, you put it on the griddle and you know, cook it, flip it on the other side. Um, and that's it. I'm, I'm actually in my commercial kitchen. I'm at my restaurant in this video. Um, and obviously it was pre-pandemic probably. So I, was, I still had a, there's a pupusa once it's already uh, finished. So they're just like golden brown, kind of crispy on the outside and just soft. And the cheese is all melted in the inside. So when you pull it apart, the cheese just stretches out. Um, and they're just, they're so good. <laughs> Wow, I didn't, like, I would not, I wondered how in the world do they stuff this pupusa? Like, I never would have guessed that you make a ball first and then flatten it out. But I'm like wondering, how do you get beans and cheese in the pupusa? It's just like, wow, but now I see. Yeah, and you know what the interesting part is? Making the pork is like a three or four hour process. Right, so that's the toughest thing. Beans, normally what we do is we do the refried beans. So you, you cook the beans with your spices and then eventually you, you um, put them through a, um, you know, either a food processor um, and then you add a little bit of oil and that's what gives it the consistency. And then we, and we use, I think in El Salvador, they use a lot of lard. We don't use lard here. We just use vegetable oil when we make ours. And it's easier for people that are vegetarian. Um, they can still eat, you know, our beans because we don't yes. use our animal product. Um, but yeah, but the pork is just, you know, you take, um, you know, the pork shoulder, you cut it up, you, you, we cook it with orange peels to got to give it a little bit of a taste and some mm -hmm. salt. And then once you take it out of there, you grind it and you make it almost into like a pate. And then you actually put it in a vat with, um, you, you, in a food processor, you run tomatoes, green peppers, onions, some spices, and then you just cook it and you have to keep stirring it for about an hour until it Ooh, cooks. It's yeah, and it becomes just like it becomes like a paste, like a paste, like almost like a yeah. pate. And then from there, that's the traditional pork that you use. Um, so that it's a whole process just to make that. And then from there, you usually use you mix it with the cheese. Um, so that's you know, and and so every every little thing, every little thing takes a lot of time, and it's all done by hand. So you have you know, you can understand like you know when your mom took the time to make these pupusas at home, it's something that is a labor of love, you know, of it's course. To treat. Um, of course, a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. If it takes just three, I mean, just three hours for the meat to cook, like, yeah. 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 Wow. So did you grow up, did you learn to make pupusas from your mom, grandmother, YouTube? No, no, definitely from my mom. Just watching, watching her make them um, and just experimenting. That's how I learned how to cook was, uh, luckily I had a commercial kitchen to experiment in you know, because it's a lot easier to just have everything handy. Um, yes. But I, I loved, you know, obviously I love to eat, you know, I got, I got the cheeks to show it. Um, <laughs> but um, it's something that my mom, you know, for my mom, it was me and my brother, you know, traditionally, um, you know, in the Latino family, it was always the daughters, you know, but we definitely broke the mold in the sense that my mom was like, you know, my mom could do anything, you know, not just cook. She was an entrepreneur. She was a business person. She, I know that's right. She just did everything. I mean, she used to sell gold. She used to bake bread and sell it around the neighborhood. So she was an entrepreneur, you know, and that's what I grew up with. But the other thing was, it really was just me having that interest and also trying to help my mother out. You know, be like, you know what? My mom has worked hard. Let me at least help her by cooking a meal myself. Of you course. Know? So, so that brought my interest. And obviously working in the kitchen in my restaurant, uh, growing up in that you know environment, um, I just love to experiment, you know, and um, I love to make people happy, you know. So one of those things is you know seeing the smile on somebody's face when they're eating something that you've made. Um, there's just a satisfaction to that, you know, and that's something that um, we definitely uh, continue in the, in the in the restaurant industry. Mm -hmm. So tell the guests about los choros. What does los choros mean? Does it mean anything? Sure. Yeah, Los Choros means, um, literally it means like the waterfalls. Um, and it was actually named after this tourist place in El Salvador where you have like spring waterfalls, like waterfalls that fall into these pools of natural, obviously it's natural spring water. 
but you can go swimming there. So the reason they named it that, my parents had never even been to this place when they named it, but um, there was a place in Osal in, in, in DC called El Tamarindo, which is a famous beach in, in El Salvador. So there weren't many restaurants, like Los Churros was the first Salvadoran restaurant in Montgomery County. Um, so when they wanted to name the restaurant, they wanted to name it something that would resonate to people that are from El Salvador. You know, it's like somebody in, let's say, El Salvador, and you see a restaurant that's called, you know, Yosemite, or it's called, um, you know, Potomac, the Potomac River restaurant or something. It would yeah. be something that would like bring you back and be like, okay, that's a place from, you know, the U.S., you know. And exactly. This day, they wanted to find a place that was from um, El Salvador. Um, so that's where they, the name came from. So it literally means like the waterfalls, you know, and, um, and, and that's really, um, you know, the, the story behind it. And that came from, from my parents. Um, so it's been 33 years. You know, we opened up in Wheaton. We were uh, a little carryout kind of, 16, uh, 1,600 square feet. And eventually we expanded in, nine, in the early 90s into an adjacent space that was 3,000 square feet. So, you know, we have seating for 170 people. Um, it's become a really good place to go to for big events. You know, if you have a large family, you got 30, 40 family members showing up, you know, you know, you can show up at our restaurant and, um, you know, we'll take care of you. Wow. So what year were you, oh, did you guys officially open? So we opened in, I think, January of 1989. Uh, so we just celebrated um, in January uh, 33 years. Congratulations. I was going to say Thank that. You. Yeah, and it was a big milestone, and we did a big we did a big event for the 30th anniversary, and you know, most likely, hopefully, we'll do another one for 35. And you, and you will. Yeah. And you will. So you only have the one location in Wheaton. Yeah, we we have one location. We had another one for years in Gaithersburg. It was it was Los Churros as well, um, but at some point, once we after we expanded in Wheaton. It got to the point where it was me and my mother running the business in Gaithersburg, and then my father and my brother running the one in Wheaton, and we just never saw each other. You know, <laughs> the restaurant business is a seven day a week job. You know, I so know. It got to the point where like the money was great, we were doing, you know, but if you can't enjoy it, then there's no point. And if you're not enjoying your family, then it's, you know, it's one of those things where we just said, you know what, we ended up selling the one in Gaithersburg to a family member. Um, it's still there to this day. Um, it's under another name. It's called Ihalisco. Um, and they actually opened another one later on. So it was a successful business as well. But we just, you know, I went to college and I just didn't have the time to commit with my mom. And my mom finally said, hey, your aunt's looking for another restaurant. And um, so we ended up selling to my aunt and, you know, the rest is history. Wow. So the other restaurant specializes in the same cuisine. It's a Salvadorian it's Tex-Mex and Salvadoran. Um, the interesting is like we started with Tex-Mex partly because it was a relative of mine. It's my aunt's husband who worked at a Tex-Mex restaurant um, that it was, I forget the name. It was a chain that was around back in the day. And um, so he learned everything about the Tex-Mex cuisine. So uh, in the early 80s was when, when they opened their restaurant, they have a restaurant called the Tamarindo in Annas Morgan. Um, when they opened in 1882, Nobody knew Salvadoran cuisine, right? Nobody knew what a pupusa was. Um, so what they did is they started with Tex-Mex because a lot of people knew what burritos and fajitas and things and tacos were. Um, they started with that menu, but then they added the Salvadoran side to it. Um, and then eventually people started trying the pupusas, started falling in love with them. And right, all of a sudden, why not? there was Salvadoran restaurants all over the place, you know? Um, but the Tex-Mex is what drew people in because if they had opened just the Salvadoran restaurant pupusas, it would have just been people from El Salvador coming to visit, um, but they had the 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 know-how and just to just say, you know what, we'll draw them in with fajitas, but we'll you know we'll make them try our pupusas, and eventually they're gonna switch to you know they're gonna fall in love. They're going yeah. to fall in love. Yes. Wow. Well, now I know how to make a pupusa. Thank you so much, Omar. Oh, thank you, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. Likewise, pleasure having you. Oh, well, now I want a pupusa. No, honestly, though, I really did not know that that pupusa has that whole process. I mean, I knew it takes a long time to make a pupusa, but I didn't think it starts from a ball into flattening it out. I just really wanted to know. I never, I was trying to understand, trying to do the math, but whatever, we got it now. 
we're gonna move on and our next uh, next guest specializes in Jamaican cuisine it is mr. Mark Henry and we're gonna go ahead and introduce him but first we're gonna have our guest performer Miss Justine perform another lovely song for us so Justine the stage is all yours
just as long as you stand, stand by me. Oh, darling, darling, stand by me. Oh, stand by me. Stand by me. Stand by me. If the sky that we look upon should tumble and fall, and the mountain should only like the sea, I won't cry. I won't cry. No, I won't shed a tear just as long. As you stand, stand by me, and darling, darling, stand by me, oh, stand by me, stand by me, stand by me. Darling, darling, stand by me. Oh, stand by me. Stand by me. Stand by me. Whenever you're in trouble, won't you stand by me? Oh, stand. Stand by me, stand by me. Another one, another one, thank you. Another one of those songs that I just know from the movies and I never really knew the lyrics. I probably still don't, but very beautiful. Thank you so much, Mr. Steen. And I really, really thank you for beautiful voice. So without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna invite Mr. Mark, who is a island boy cuisine. And surprisingly, it's actually not a restaurant. It is a manufacturing business and they do have a special jerk seasoning. So let's get to it, Mr. Mark. Now, how are you doing today? I am well. Thank you so much. How are you? Doing wonderful. Excited to be here and share with your viewers a little bit about Island Boy Cuisine. Yes, I'm excited. I love, I'm intrigued already. I see we're in the kitchen. That's right. Okay. So let us know, what are we doing today? Today, I'm going to be preparing for you a uh, grilled jerk seasoned shrimp kebab. And, um, we're using 13, 15 shrimp. These are the larger ones. So 13, 15 means 13 to 15 shrimps make a pound. So they're quite large, as you can see. Yes. So do you want me to go ahead and start preparing it for you? Yes, please. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get some of these on the grill. Um, and then I'll show you how we, we marinate, we go through the process of making them. So. Here I have my 13, 15 shrimp. And what you need to do is once you get your shrimp, they're normally frozen. You wanna make sure that you take them out of the bag and drain them properly. Make sure they're kind of dry to the touch from the outside. So those 13, 15 shrimp, you can find them at your local grocery store? You can find them at your local grocery store. Most times you'll find them um, peeled and deveined. 
those are the good ones to the best ones to use because you don't have the shell holding up which holds on to a lot of moisture yes so what you want to do with your shrimp or what first thing you got to do is make sure you get island boy jerk seasoning you can get that at islandboycuisine.com and with our seasoning, I have to tell you, unlike a lot of other jerk seasoning out there, we do not add a lot of salt. A lot of the jerk seasoning you find out there is high in sodium. Yes. So whenever you're using Island Boy cuisine product, you're going to need to add salt to your your the dish that you're preparing. So to get us started. Which is good. At least you have control of your salt level because yes, sometimes some of these jerk seasonings, you think you poured a whole bottle of salt in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not selling salt. I'm selling flavor, baby. I know that's right. <laughs> so I have about a pound of shrimp here. I want to use about a half tablespoon. And a little bit of those are far away. Mm -hmm. um, so once we get that on there, we're going to mix it up a bit. We also have our peppers and onions. To make your life easier, you can go ahead and add them to your marinade as well. So, so that way they get coated a little bit. And with seafood, it's important that you do not add salt to let it marinate. If you add salt too far ahead of time, what will happen is that your seafood will become tough. So you gotta be very mindful of that. Oh, okay. So the there, the are marinated, and it doesn't take long. Seafood, traditionally, it's, it's uh, very delicate. So you don't want to have it sitting in the marinade too long or else it'll become tough. And in the case of shrimp, if there's an acid you add to it, it's going to- uh, That's a cook. Exactly. So you can just go ahead and basically at this point, we're going to start with our skewers. We'll start with the onions on the bottom. And we want to turn our shrimp into like a C format. Of course. And we run the skewer through the head and the tail. And then yeah. we're going to... Yeah, so your shrimp you... isn't like... Go ahead, Lena. I said, right, so your shrimp isn't, you know, out of place. Correct, correct. So, we, you know, Jamaica is traditionally known for colors. Um, the colors of the flag is black, green, and gold. But for Rasta, it's red, green, and gold. So we always carry that out as, as wherever we can in our cuisine, our cooking. We like to show our color. Interesting. So we just slide them down. We have three shrimp on each skewer, and that is more than enough for each person. So, um, no, I need, I definitely need two. <laughs> so here I'm using a little bit of melted salt to season my seafood while it's on the grill. And we're just gonna take that and turn it a little, let it start to scorch or sear on the, the griddle. Now you can do this in the oven or on a grill. And of course, it's best on a charcoal grill outside. Of course. You know, so you use what is convenient to you. Uh, hopefully we don't set off the fire alarm tonight or smoke detector tonight. I, um, definitely because jerk automatically. I every time I'm cooking with jerk, jerk as well. The smoke detector goes off. I'm like, nothing's even cooking yet, but just the jerk <laughs> itself. So it's okay. We're prepared. I, so while this is going, I'm going to start on my sauce. Now we want to try and balance. So whenever you're having something spicy, you want something that's kind of cool. And for us, we're going to be making a, a cream sauce to go with it. Um, I'm using sour cream, and to that, I'm going to add a, a half a lime. I'm going to squeeze the juice from that into it. And then, of course, I want to build that bridge between the sauce and the, the seafood. So I'm going to add a little bit more uh, jerk seasoning to that as well. And we just mix it around and kind of make it become kind of smooth and buttery. 
you can add as much as you want, but in our case here, we want to, as I said, we want to create that bread where you're not just getting pure heat, you're getting a little subtleness um, along with the shrimp, the seafood mm -hmm. itself. All right, so it's almost similar to a tzatziki if you were to add like a cucumber or some other cooling effect. If you have like a um, mango pulp, that would also be good too. You know, and that's what we have going there. We're going to turn our shrimp. We constantly want to turn it so that way it doesn't scorch too much. And what that does is it helps to distribute the heat evenly as you're cooking. It helps with that process. Um, questions, please, have your... Yes. yes, so I mean, I know it takes a while to, it's a lot of trial and error to get your jerk seasoning perfectly. So how long did it take you to get it? When did you finally get the right one that you said, okay, I'm gonna put this one in the box to sell? Well, it's funny enough, I, I grew up, growing up in Jamaica, we used to go to the home of jerk and there was a guy there, God rest his soul, his name was Tari and Boston Bay in the parish of Portland is the home of dirt. And he showed me how to make it. But obviously there was something that I was missing. It actually took me about 15 years to get it right. And when I did, I just decided there and then, you know what, I'm going to market with this. And so, you know, when I, I attended CIA, Culinary Institute of America, um, famous culinary school around the world. And one of my professors challenged me in my charcuterie class to develop a sausage. And I said, you know what, being from Jamaica, we need to have a national sausage. So I said, you know what, I'm gonna try and work on jerk and use it there. And it wasn't until about 15 years after I graduated that I got it perfect. I got it to the point where I'm like, yes, this is it. Now with jerk, jerk started with the runaway slaves and the Taino Indians in Jamaica. And so when they developed jerk, they didn't have um, all these fend angles that they're putting in there now. So jerk, my jerk is made of like it would be way back when. There's no um, turmeric or no, none of that fancy stuff. Like more the traditional <laughs> way. Yes, these are just fresh herbs and spices scotch bonnet pepper on the off chance where i can't get scotch bonnet pepper i don't make it but i i'll blend it where i use scotch bonnet pepper with habanero and the reason for that is scotch bonnet has a distinct bouquet nose floral smell to it that you don't find in habanero it also has a, a different heat level scotch bonnet is much higher in scoville they're measuring the heat in Scoville unit. And so you do not find that in um, habanero. It's not a bad pepper. Don't get me wrong. But when you have in scotch bonnet, you know you have it in scotch bonnet. Yes. So when you use scotch bonnet, you use it in a fresh form or you do is it dry scotch bonnet? We use it in a, a fresh form. And actually, when we make it at the facility, everybody's wearing a nose covering. And, you know, we make it try to make it late in the evening because when you come back the next morning, the aroma of the peppers is still there, but it's not as pungent and it won't burn your eyes. Oh, makes sense. Yeah, because after you finish cutting that and you, yeah, no, it definitely stays on the, your fingertips and it definitely will burn your eyes. I've experienced it yeah. before, trust me. <laughs> Yeah, I, I bet you'll never do it again. I'm sure never. Will I now are using gloves. Right, 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 right. So, yeah. So, our, if you can zoom in here a little bit, please. You notice our peppers are getting blistered and our shrimp is getting a little bit of color to it. We want to yes. continue cooking that until we get a nice orange color to it. And that way we'll know the shrimp is cooked. The Perfect. flavors are seeping through it and, and um, marinating the seafood as it cooks. What I'm going to do is, while that is going through the magic of TV, I already have one prepared already. So I am going to plate that up for you. Um, and we can continue. Please bring on the questions. 
Oh, wow. So what got you into cooking? Um, I wasn't very confident as a young man with um, what we say in Jamaica, lyrics in the girls, the fear of sin. <laughs> and so while I was in school, I thought, you know, if I can't get through that, get to a woman's heart through my, my mouth, I'm going to get to her through her stomach. And so I decided I wanted to learn how to cook. Um, since then, my mom also had a restaurant. And so she was very passionate about what she did and it kind of rubbed off on me. Did you grow up like with a typical, I know Sunday dinner is very important. Did you grow up with a typical Sunday dinner home? Oh, of, of course. It's not, it's not Jamaica unless you have rice and peas on Sunday and brown stew chicken. Occasionally we might do an oxtail, but um, most of the Sunday dinner, it's uh, fricassee chicken or brown stew chicken as an awful wrapper too. And, uh, and then of course you, they cook enough so that we have leftover for the next day. Now I want all of that. I told you I love this Jamaican cuisine. I love some oxtail and some brown stew chicken and some red snapper, just everything. Right, 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 right. Come on, that's very good. <laughs> Take a look on our shrimp there. Yep, nice and brown. Right, 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 right. So. This is what our end dish is going to look like. We just Lovely. want to, right. Yeah, let's put that on there. And basically, this is a quick evening dish um, for you. Hopefully, the lighting is good enough. Yes, that's it looks our, delicious. Yes, that's our, and what I served it with is over a bed of rice with lime zest, fresh squeezed lime, and, um, a little bit of uh, curry powder in the making of it. It doesn't show up. I just put enough in there to flavor the rice and that will complement the dish. Wow, so now we know we have to go to islandboycuisine.com to get the jerk seasoning so we can replicate this dish. Thank you so much. We're gonna go ahead and drop the link on, on, the, on the chat so our guests can know where to find the spices. Right. And thank you again so much for showing us about showing us how to make this lovely jerk shrimp kebab. Thank you. All right, and for other videos, you can check me out on YouTube at Cooking with Island Boy Cuisine. There are lots more that you can use our jerk seasoning for, as well as our jerk sauce. Perfect, perfect. All right, thank you so much again. And now we're gonna go ahead and allow our guests to interact with us. We're gonna invite Mr. Omar back on the floor. And if anybody has any questions, we're gonna use that time to do so now. Someone, Miss Sweetly said she loves the presentation of your food. Well, thank you, thank you very much. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and use this time. We can use the chat box to ask any questions. If you need any tips. We have both Mr. Omar here and also Mr. Mark. Omar's video is off right now, but he is here on audio. So if you wanna ask him about pupusas, you can do so. If you wanna ask Mr. Mark about the jerk seasoning, we can also do that as well. What is the best way to make rice and peas? You can actually use Island Boy Cuisine dirt season for that. <laughs> I know that's right. Yeah, I, 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 it's, it's, it's cheating, but it comes out just as good. Typically what I would do if I'm in a rush on a Sunday afternoon is I take like a teaspoon of uh, my jerk seasoning along with a cup of rice a can of coconut milk, and just combine that all together and with my red kidney beans, preferably the dark red kidney beans. Just put them in a pot. You want to bring the coconut milk with the beans to a boil. Um, again, you have to add salt. And when you add salt, you need to taste your liquid and it should actually taste salty. 
Don't worry about it. Just as it tastes a little salty, you add your rice to it. That rice is going to absorb all of those flavors and just come together to create a bridge that you can't miss. If you know how to cook rice, you're good to go from there. 20 minutes in the oven. A quick and easy way to do it is once your liquid with your rice comes to a boil, turn it down to low and give it 20 minutes. After about 20 minutes, use a fork to fluff the rice and you should be good. Do you use um, like dry kidney beans or canned kidney beans? Canned kidney beans. This is how you're going to cheat with it. You're going to literally use the, the canned kidney beans and you're good to go. Okay, thank you kidney for kidney that beans. because, yeah, those dry kidney beans actually take a long time to cook. That's right. That's right. Yeah, when I tried to make rice and peas once and everything was actually pretty perfect. I But the beans were not cooked thoroughly, mm -hmm. so it just threw the whole dish off. <laughs> I, I have to confess, I've had a, a few times experience with that, a few times. Right, because once you throw the rice in there, it's You're starting again with friend. dry kidney beans is just so, just too much. Right, right, right. Well, a tip in cooking kidney be um, dry kidney beans is you want to soak your beans overnight. Then what you want to do is bring them to a boil on the stove, but put garlic cloves in there. So once it comes to a boil, Turn off your stove for about two hours, leave it in the liquid, and then you turn it on back, and then you go again. And it, it cooks much quicker than if you were just to boil it from scratch. Your liquid is going to evaporate, and you're going to keep adding liquid, and that's going to make your beans tough. Thank you for sharing that. Right. We have a question for Mr. Omar. How old were you when you made your first pupusa by yourself? You know what? My mom, and I still do that with my kids. Um, I was pretty young, you know. I think my mom, to kind of distract her, to, you know, to let her cook, would give us dough. And we would just play with the dough and try to make our own pupusas. My pupusas were never round like my mom's. But um, I'm sure I was pretty young, you know, probably, I don't know, eight years old, six years old. Um, and with my daughters, we, we, we play around, we play around with it sometimes and let them try as well. But, um, it takes, it takes some time to get them perfectly round. Okay. And then Omar as well, what is your favorite El Salvadorian meal to make? Um, definitely the pupusas. I love, I love, <laughs> I mean, definitely that's, that's going to be the most traditional thing. And that's what my daughters ask me for when I'm coming home from the restaurant. Can you bring some pupusas home? They ask me for pupusas and they ask me for quesadillas. You know, that's more on the Mexican side. But pupusas is definitely something that even my kids, you know, which kids can be kind of picky. But yes. um, they'll definitely ask me for pupusas. It's definitely a winner in our house, too, or a daughter. <laughs> you know <laughs> what? The, your shrimp, I mean, I got to find out where, where I need to go, you know. And I I'd actually, um, I, you know, I actually did a lot of work with the Jamaican community. My dad um, and a bunch of, a group of investors, they used to bring the national soccer teams over from El Salvador. Nice. So yeah. then we would bring another team from different countries. So Jamaica and then Trinidad. Um, so I went to, like, Jamaican... Caribbean festivals in Baltimore. I went to a lot of, um, you know, Negril in, in downtown Silver Spring. So I got yeah. to know a lot of the uh, Jamaican restaurants. And I got to know, I think Rhodey is from Trinidad, but I think there's a Jamaican version, I think, too. Um, we, but we yeah, yeah. So I definitely um, had some very good, you know, Jamaican food. And you're reminding me of all those trips down to DC and to Baltimore. Uh, to try out all the, uh, you know, the rice and peas and the cocoa bread. And, yes. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Speaking yeah. of cocoa bread, Mark, what is your go-to dish when you're preparing a meal for people? It's pork-based most of the times. And what I like to do is I, love, I enjoy grilling a lot. So um, I mess around with the jerk, jerk spice itself. But my mom used to use star anise. And so I call it a clay night sauce, but it's basically a combination of like a jerk with um, star anise, and it brings together the cultures of Jamaica, or much of it's out of many one people. 
So we have people from China and they brought their influences. And, and so Chinese food in Jamaica is different than what you find in the US. It's very unique and the star anise is very uh, present in the dishes that they make. And so something with star anise and jerk combined, and I'm actually working on a sauce that I wanna dedicate to my mom. You oh, wow. the ingredients. Are there any restaurants that use your jerk seasoning near DC? Um, I sell mostly to hotels. So okay. you find um, the hotels that will use it for their, um, in their banquet facilities. And um, there are a few who will add it on their menu, like they'll make a, a sandwich and they'll use the jerk, jerk seasoning itself for that. And we have one more question. Omar, what is the most bizarre thing that you put in a pupusa? <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think. There's definitely, I know there's definitely been like any cook, there's definitely bad, you know, trial and error experiments. Um, but in a pupusa, yeah, I mean, I, I you know what? I, I honestly, I can't really say I really had a really bad pupusa. <laughs> I mean, I've had, I've had, I've tried some with shrimp. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't something that was like to my liking. So I think that would probably be the the worst. Actually, no, no, I tried I tried fish one time, and that would be the consistency like, because you have to, don't you have? I mean, you have to get it really. And now I'm thinking about like mashed shrimp, like. <laughs> yeah, well, it wasn't mashed. It was just di like it was diced. That wasn't bad. I tried fish, but the fish with the cheese, just to me, the, on the palate, just. Yeah, it. fish and cheese rarely go with each other hand in hand at all anyways, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. probably it's going to be, I'm going to have to say fish. I was trying to you know, play with seafood. We, we saw a lot of seafood in, in El Salvador because we have a lot of, we're, we're the, in Central America, we're the country with the largest coast, you know, um, with beaches and all that. So um, we sell a lot of lobster and fish and we sell whole fish like I think they do in Jamaica as well. You know, with yeah. the head on, you know, yeah. people that are here in the U.S. A lot of times, they get freaked out when they see the head of the fish, and I'm like, that's how I grew up. You know, right. we have the shrimp. Well, you know, we yeah, eat. I know Jamaicans eat fish head soup, but I'm like, <sighs> yeah, we we actually like on the beaches. You know, you'll have the guys who come down and they get like a big snapper head and or a group of fish head, and they'll just stew that down and go to town on it. That is a favorite for quite a few people I know. Yeah, yeah. That'd be nice. <laughs> and Mr. Mark, how do you infuse ingredients from other cultures into your cooking without losing its authenticity? Oh, I'm sorry, authenticity. Hey, we're Jamaicans, man. Um, we have people from all over. We have people from Lebanon. We have people from South Africa. <laughs> and so everybody, every culture that has been there, it was one of the main ports where people would come in during the slave trade and when people were moving towards a new world where a lot of people who didn't want to go further in the journey stopped off. So everybody brought their influences, brought their spices along with them and we all just adopted it and it's all there. So um, it might not be as pungent as you would think, but the influences definitely are mixed in. You know, uh, Omar alluded to it earlier when you talk about, for example, roti. You have roti in the Caribbean. Most people think, when they think roti, they think Trinidad and Guyana. But growing up, I knew a lady who had a shop and she had a strong Indian influence in her growing up. And that woman, Miss Brady, God bless her soul, would make roti like nobody's business, man. I'd sit and eat that all day. And also, yeah, roti also is among us Indian cuisine. It's definitely very different, but that's just how it goes back into the show. That's why we're here learning about right. different cultures and cuisines. Even, even with the curry, the curry that you find in Jamaica is very different from you find the one you find in Guyana or, or Trinidad itself. Yeah. It's completely different and has a unique flavor. Yes, it does. 
Well, I thank you both so much for being here today. We, I've learned a lot. I'm hungry. I don't know if I want pupusas or if I want some jerk shrimp. How about recipes. both? All the yeah, above, though, right? Why not, right? Why not do all? Right, right, right. Stuff with uh, jerk shrimp. Right, <laughs> apple spread, exactly. Start with that. We, we can try them out. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll experiment together. I will be there to eat. Thank you. I will definitely be there to eat. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Lena. Bye. Good night. Yes. All right. No, seriously, I am starving. But um, yeah, like I said, we're going to go ahead and now you have a chance. I hope you guys are paying attention to the answers and the questions I was asking specifically just so you have a chance to win again this is a usb bracelet this right here i mean all my secret recipes are on here okay but it just you know comes a little bit handy dandy at face marketplace hi io and yeah so this is your chance to use the chat box and the first person to answer this question is the winner da -da -da -da. like drum roll, please Okay, so the question that I want to ask is, uh, what year did Mark finally find his recipe? Whoa, Miss Lady. Well, no, Miss Ma'am. Come on. Okay, if not, what year? How long? Okay, okay. All right, there we go. That's exactly what I was gonna ask. So Miss Taria, you definitely have that answer. It did take him 15 years. And he did find it in 2002, he said. All right, and then what does Los Choros mean? Okay, we have our second winner, Miss Anita. All right, and what is the home of the jerk? Four bonus win. Drum roll. Yes, but there is a specific place in Jamaica that he said that he would travel to a specific place city something something jamaica come on see i told you to pay attention to the questions that i was asking because i was asking for a reason and they were repetitive see but y'all are probably as hungry as i am and now i just want to go get something to eat and the recipes through the recipes through your mindset's off Time's up. Well, before you go read his bio on the page, because I told you guys to pay attention, it is Portland. Portland is the home of jerk, and that's where he went to meet this lovely man that taught him about this lovely jerk seasoning, and then he came back home and he perfected it. So that's that. But for the people that did answer the questions, thank you all for participating. Thank you for paying attention. Thank you for trying. We do have Miss Tahira and Miss Sanita. That's right. That are going to be receiving these lovely, again, USB bracelets. I mean, depending on how you are, I would not want to look in a bag for a USB. So I keep all this stuff right here. So please go ahead and we're going to get some further information from you as to where to send this to. And yeah, we have now come to the end of our show. I thank you all for tuning in today. I thank all my guests. I thank all, I thank you, Miss Justine, for a lovely performance. Now I'm going to go look at the lyrics and actually sing those with that. Congratulations to our winner.
And yes, folks, thank you so much. So tune in, stay tuned. Please make sure you follow Ethics Marketplace on Instagram. If you don't follow them already, please stay tuned for our future upcoming shows. I do promise to have the video and also the recipe on our website, ethicsmarketplace.com. And until next time, good night. She shares my dreams, I hope that someday I'll share her home. I found the love to carry more than just my secrets, to carry love, to carry children of our own. We were still kids when we so well. Fighting against all us, I know we'll be all right this time. Darling, just hold my hand, be my girl, I'll be your man. I see my future in your eyes. Looking so beautiful, I don't deserve it. Darling, you look perfect tonight. Baby, I'm dancing in the dark.
Sweet, sweet. 